incalculable, effectively infinite relations of the totality of psychic activity and its outside and of the relation to the unknowable. I walk among as men, sorry, I walk among men as among the fragments and limbs of men. This is what is terrible for my eyes, that I found man in ruins and scattered as over a battlefield or a butcher field. Frederick is a Nietzsche. Yeah. Understood formally, an aphorism is present as a fragment. It is the form of pluralist thought in its claims to articulate and formulate a sense, the sense of of a being, an action, a thing. These are the objects of the aphorism. Only the aphorism is capable of articulating sense. The aphorism is inter interpretation and the art of interpreting. Gilles Deleuze, Nietzsche and philosophy. Much of Nietzsche's writing takes the form of aphorism, short, terse statements that resist strict formalization. The aphorism displays another relationship to thought in that it often brings together scattered elements into a single point, but at the same time suspends the process of completion. As a form, it invariably works through the power of metaphor, which remains active, relational and incomplete in its embodiment. For Nietzsche, this use of form corresponded to the belief that intelligibility was not governed by transcendent final meanings, but rather was the site for opening out the play of meaning without restriction. In this regard, the aphorism is a play with the state of forces within which expression occurs and in turn transforms the sense of this according to the new forces assembled. But the urn of language is so fragile, it crumbles and immediately you blow into the dust of words yeah, that I, are the cinder I, I think, itself. You know, we're maybe talking a slight process. That's an aphoristic, so very much an aphoristic to, book. You know, present oh. various ideas, even if you say to the engineers, you know, just you get their feedback, but you don't progress down, you know, let's say modifications of two pen plaza, because we might be looking at four different options. Each instant covers the entire world. The loading bay, but you're saying, Dojin. you know, this is what we're looking at. And, you know, he was one of the founders so of Zen Buddhism in Japan. In that area. So I don't think just because you don't have he travelled in China for you don't many years. Nobody's saying final scheme. I'm this just is the um, Southern Sun artist. This is from about the year 1200. His studies of water, my UN. In a way, it reminds me of the Sugimoto work. I think the Sugimoto must have come across it. It's in the um, museum in Beijing. I mean, it's not displayed, but there's something like 10, 12 album leaves, so small paintings. And the, the words on the painting stated that the cloud has borne the sea in Chinese. What is that again? Cloud has borne the sea. Yeah, so you get this beautiful resonance between the image and the uh, word, image and word. So you get this complete dialect between poetry and painting. Poetry is painting without the brush. Can we just park that just painting is poetry with the brush. Something like that. Actually, I, I got a lot of inspiration from this kind of painting, just, how to express and to present the, the water in my in my work, the brush stroke. Yeah, it's very... That the baseline design we were developing in the short term was based around the 60... I'm, I'm calling it 60 and 80 foot just as a shorthand. Just read a couple more. Um, and, you know, we think the, the Southern Song artist Ma Yuan, 1160 to 1225, painted a series of album paintings of the different conditions of the lake. This was a pure act of observing the response of water to the prevailing weather conditions. It was also a study in emptiness that reflected Chan Buddhist philosophical, philosophical tenets. In the 19th century, Caspar Deva Friedrich painted The Monk by the Sea which was pictorially close to the appearance of song painting. Likewise, John Constable painted fragments of cloud formations that mixed observations with wonder, but over 600 years divide these episodes.
and is monked by the sea, early 19th century, by Caspar David Friedrich. You can see this painting in Berlin. Go to Berlin, it's in the well, National I think, I think it's, Museum. it's fair to say, though, with the 80-foot train hall and system, maybe you're... you're, you're I think it's on the museum island. Than I am, or a lot of, lot of people. How, how large is I it? Anything can be made it's a small for, painting. You know, for a mm. degree of disruption and a degree of cost, which is an unknown fact. Silence is the hidden companion so, of the fragment, so think, lending you know, resonance if, its condition. No there is always something which is unspeakable work, or know, unseeable. We have some I names for those conditions, the void, aporia, otherness, emptiness, all of which serve to rupture the ability to name things. So this is the constable. You can see constable studies of clouds in the v &A on the first floor. Visually numerous studies of sky. Whenever you visit Norfolk, the skies seem a lot bigger than any part of the country. What is aporia? Aporia is um, A is not. Aporia is porous, not porous. You can't go through. You can't pass through. So aporia is a Greek word for blockage. You know, or for something which doesn't express itself. A 60, 80 or a 200 foot wide train hall. So, I mean, I think so it becomes a philosophical yeah, word, so I'm, you know, particularly with the figures like Jack, Jack Derrida. For the presentation. Well, let's mm -hmm. so many things that don't work, right? Yeah. Who yeah. else would like to read? Because those don't work, we can't Banda. See. Oh, no, 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 that's not, 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 no, no, sis, I'm not, I'm not saying... Okay, not hello, everybody. Um, yeah. The proposal that art might be defined as unheimlich implies a strangeness at the heart of its becoming. Without a stable identity to fall into place, art contests itself even as art, passing through itself in order to become outside or external to itself. This is a raft of Medusa by Jericho. This is in the Louvre. It's a magnificent room in the Louvre with all the 19th century history painting. We're validating. We're seeing what works, what can't work. Sorry, I can't, can't quite read the top. Um, that's on a second. Oh, yeah. The remains of a ship, of a shipwreck, bodies piled upon bodies, some alive, some half dead, and the rest dead. When Jericho painted it, painted it, 1818 to 9, he had limbs of the dead in his studio because he wanted to smell death as he painted it. The painting is a reflection about history painting, but also the impossibility of presenting history as a totality. Thus, the fate of the living and that of the dead are intertwined in a new space of depiction one which would disturb the symbolic order of the political establishment. This painting was really had a huge public. It came to London and people queued to see it, like going to the cinema, paying a fee to, to buy a ticket to see it. That's the assumption that I was... I mean, John was... Last time you guys were here, you guys, we all sat in a room and... When it says, um, oh, sorry, um, just wanted to do that last phrase about um, upsetting the political establishment, uh, disturb the symbolic order of the political establishment. Um, uh, what political establishment would that be and what was disturbed? French, French political establishment, the ruling classes. And it, was a, it was a scandal about... Um, Safety on ships and um, I mean, it set up a whole chain of reactions. So it's like any any disaster usually creates a, a disturbance within the symbolic order. Yeah. Like presently, the war 
in uh, because I think Gaza Strip. John, Scottish John, is of the opinion this serves of a symbolic the symbolic order. Or the sixty-foot train the post the office skunk is this. Uh, you know, yeah, all these things have a so that everybody's yeah. crystal clear. So when everything's not as it should be, this is the claimless move to totality of being in control. It's just a yeah, and sometimes an event can kickstart a whole change in the political establishment. This is Jericho, painting of limbs. How did he get hold of these limbs? And I guess, you know, kind of weird. I mean, if you did someone do that today, there'd be some uproar about someone... I, I, you know, I, I, getting I, I hold of dead, either, dead, if, dead body parts. As we've had a contact in the morgue. Right. I mean, it's like Joel Peter Whitkin went to Mexico to get his dead bodies and dead heads. Yeah, it could easily change two weeks after that, but we just so it's not dissimilar to say whatever it is, and we just agree yeah. and we go forward on that basis. And I'm saying, I think it might just be a so phone it's call utterly between red on. Stefan and John and yeah. Sarah or a phone call or whatever. Balloon mounts towards infinity. Fine by me if they it's one of his noir etchings or yeah, drawings. Jonathan, when when was this done? Late late nineteenth late nineteenth century, eighteen eighty two, I think. Very important artist. I mean, his work is in terms of further investigation, on paper. There, yeah, there's no way between almost now and the 13th that we'll have all the ducks in, a, in, in its entirety on a small scale. Because it, it's just too complicated. So, but, but there's an exhibition of, of paperwork of so the, all the other stuff that we present impressions and post impressions and symbolists you know, in the, the Royal Academy. And he's got a wall of about five drawings, they're really magnificent. Very important artist, he, with Gustav Moreau, the and poet Malami. Yeah. Um, they anticipated a lot of the, the things to do with the unconscious so, and okay. dream work. And, yeah, okay. I mean, the, the, the blast issue is just one of many that define the thing. Had an important influence on Picasso. No, it, it looks like a surrealist, that, obviously, the before the surrealism. The Comte de L'Entremont was a symbolist who influenced uh, surrealism. This is Max Klinger. He did a sequence of prints called the glove, I think nine prints in all, where a glove goes on a walkabout through the night, which is almost like dream association. Uh, just before we get Liz and all these people uh, changing models around, we just need to agree what they're changing it to. Sure. There's a rescue of the glove. Okay. Um, other than that, I think we're all pretty... Well, so I think it's nine or ten. Otherwise. A very important um, series of prints. Anything want to bring up? Michael or Sisto? I think so. Um... This is Sora Seated Boy from 1883. <laughs> Wonderful yeah, drawing. This is in the Royal Academy. Club. It's much more radical than his paint, his large paintings. Talking about, has... Much more important, I think. He um, did away with the relationship to the contour in drawings. Yeah, I mean, I so as if the the figure comes out of shadow. It's like a weaving of light and darkness, but without a differentiation of figure and ground in the usual way. Internal to art is a withdrawal from art, and this manifests as a spacing at the root of the art itself. The spacing takes the form of the unspeakable, which is the intimacy of the outside. I've put these statements, um, they kind of 
Yeah, I don't mean to make this. The, you, you can't know, translate them. Preventing blasts. I mean, it's just a small part. They of it. play upon what you. I'm saying is we'd like to present, um, you know, where we but they also go against the grain. By any means. They don't it's illustrate. There's no image which goes room, with them. You know, what do people think? And you guys do. You know, your your bits. I don't know if they work. I don't know, but they have a rhythmical. We're not going to crack um, one go. So sense to running through the text. So that's that's what the point of it was. And, you know, I can understand Amy's getting a bit this is about it. This is And his you know, say, you know, this is notebooks for his poems of this morning of his child. Malame's second child, um, sorry, I've got a little... Anatoly. Anatoly. Anatoly died in 1879, aged eight. Malami embarked from a series of poetic fragments as a memorial or a symbolic tomb. He was emotionally unable to complete this, so they remained unpublished. Malami's poetry experimented with the silent spacing of language and the role of chance. Within this was an aspiration to discover the pure word. <laughs> so this is the throw of the dice will never abolish chance from 1897. He was a friend with Manet who painted his portrait. One thing I, I was understood, so we're not paying, I was like, not, we're not paying, FX is not paying attention. Okay. This time when we're, I thought like we talked about superstructure two weeks ago with Expedition. Poetry is a, it, poetry in aspiring towards the condition of the pure word or caesura and as such interrupts or forces language to give way. In emptying or hollowing out language, a new reality or condition is opened. Fragmentation in writing testifies both to a failure and a possibility. As a manifestation of failure, it opens out a wound of what cannot be said or represented. As such, it is both a breakdown that is linked to a desire to break through. Living with a threat of collapse, there is a constant assertion of the ability to continue whilst tittering, uh, is teetering on the edge of dissolution. The possibility that opens out through this quest to continue leads to the opening out of a new form of writing based on the mixture of economies of form and formlessness. Now that load kind of falls on the, onto the station. So just by chance, oh, I, I see what you're in 1895, there were three inventions of the X-ray, the cinema, and psychoanalysis. Not psychoanalysis. You could say this is the moment of a kind of modernity which opens out the 20, uh, 20th century. Yeah. It's amazing just looking at that now how they didn't, you know, like the person's got their rings on and bangles and stuff. Uh, it wouldn't happen now. <laughs> and I imagine they got an extremely high dose of um, electrons. <laughs> Probably not very healthy. And, the and fragment is a site of resistance to truth and a system kind of building, enacting instead a process of interruption of representation so is, and mimesis. It. So that means you don't change the thermal envelope of it, the thermal enclosure of it. That's like the minimal option. Can anyone say why this is an anti-mimetic painting? Why this was the main, the roof, but open the almost manifesto the roof, against the mimesis? Well, the second one? It's, it's, yeah, it's take the sides off and rebuild the lower. Yeah, okay. And then the third option is get rid of it entirely. And why does it... Uh, why is this as much a symbolist so painting as a cubist painting? So two questions. The third option, okay. And, and what you're saying is if you're doing the second option, is that... Is it basically because then you two of the faces are changing? Is that what you're saying? You can read them your, so as being something more from historical the reference. reference. Oh, it's the third option. So the faces, there's two African masks, faces, two Iberian sculptures in the center, an Egyptian face. It's not just an African painting. It's pre, pre, um, pre Greek in its reference. Or not. So it's not classical. 
Yeah, it's okay. Partly but not mimetic. Say we're just at the moment we're not spending. A lot I mean, the, ma the mask the itself is about the MSG um, mimesis, um, but although obviously it's not, it's not mimetic yeah, exactly. Nice and the to, Egyptians to always painted their and portrayed their faces and in profile flattened. Mm. Um, so they're not. I mean, they're not sort of. Um, Cartesian representations are not exact. I don't know if that's what you're getting at. There's also something strange about one of the African masks. What is it? Well, it's also uh, quite fragmented, isn't it? It's not... An, it's... The top mask. What? Look at the face. What's strange about it? The eyes blacked out? One of the eyes is blacked out. Which takes you inwards. Uh -huh. He called it his fetish painting. So it's more about the person looking at it than it. I mean, it does. It it undoes you. You imagine entering into a brothel. You've got these figures staring at you. I mean. Yeah, the fact that these are naked women know, staring at you is, um, what's the word? Uh, you know, if you think of the history of the, the, na the nude, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it was quite recent to this that the nude started to look at you. Um, prior, prior to that, the nude would never look you in the face. So this, and this is much more extreme than the earlier ones, right? So and that ventilation it's you know, really is because you've opened up the side uh, of the taboo at that time, at least. It's almost the cutting up of space is violent. I can tell you, I remember what kind of flattened, flattens the pictorial space. So it's a clips of distance. So it. it it breaks down distance and flattens space. Okay, no, that's fine. But so you I'm are talking about it in relation to the mimetic. The um, okay. You say um, more about that. I mean, it it takes you into the realm of forces rather than appearances. So it's not the copying of things as they appear, but rather the presentation of forces. So this is a kind of truth to appearance. It is representation. Whereas this is a presentation of forces, a becoming of forces. It's also the point at which Eros crosses over into Thanatos. So it's also, it's not beautiful. They don't look vulnerable at all, right? They look very uh, aggressive and strong and powerful, which is um, Picasso strange. was absolutely fearful of getting syphilis <laughs> because he, syphilis was associated with blindness. So they... Now have this disturbing quality of going to him with the night, into the night, and with dreams. He also, when he was painting his painting, um, a German artist committed suicide by hanging, who was part of his circle. He was experimenting with drugs, larger men, and opium. And it beat Picasso out, he stopped taking drugs. And it stayed on his, it stayed leaning against the studio wall for about eight or nine years. He showed it to Andre Samon and George Brack and a few other critics and painters, and they were shocked and horrified by it. And he just leaned it against his wall, against the wall of his studio. It's unseen for seven, eight years. So as if it couldn't be seen, it was so shocking.
Picasso opened the new century with powerful anti-mimetic fragmentary statements of intent. The painting, although stylistically pointed, although stylistically pointed the way forward, collecting together the realm of the dead as a counterpoint, and within this opened out the space between the look and the gaze. This is why Picasso saw it as a fetish painting, because it re reorganized the symbolic structure that lay behind Mimesis. Well, the term fetish has assumed numerous meanings. Thursday, Firstly, inanimate objects that have powers or qualities that distribute forces. Uh, just, Secondly, uh, it is used by Karl Marx to describe uh, the power of commodities over social life. Thirdly, to describe the displacement of sexual energy into objects such as shiny boots. In each case, the object in question has a double life or split identity, and this in turn denotes the assumption of the power of an object over a subject. This power is invisible and cannot be measured. This continuous and incomplete, yeah, I mean, the fragment have, expands and contracts I mean, around the, itself, aspiring to become its state, own object in order to exceed itself. You know, on two pentagons, you got those big ducts, you got the columns, you got about ten other things to that are problems to sort out. This is a still life by Picasso. Why is it so radical at the time it was made? Anything else anybody wants to bring up? There's a real basket. Yeah, you use the, the real, real rope and real the, the, the weaving of the chair. But also there's a, a pun in it. What's the pun? And the changing it as well. What's the what's the root of view? What does that relate to? Cause, the cause the, cause, yeah, because the, you know, the basket he used and also, the, you know, the perspective and the how it's become together. But, how all this, so I can imagine back to that time, probably don't usually, the, you know, the artist won't be, won't be usually doing this way. So that's why I was just thinking, this painting back to that context oh, is kind of uh, strange. <laughs> We've talked to but Zhu, sorry about uh, We've about Zhu, you. what's uh, what's what does that relate to? Play. Play. It's journal. It's journal in French. But it's also Zhu is the root of Zhu essence. Um. So it's got different connotations. So he played with the. The newspaper and journal is a is a series of puns. So it's not it's opening out the signifying function. So the real objects, real um, real surfaces and simulated surfaces. In this still life painting by Picasso, 1912, depictions of things are mixed by real things, in this case, chair caning and rope. Space, time and matter are reconfigured in order to present an image of what is an unknown dimension of reality. So at this time there's beginning to be talk about the fourth dimension. Hilma F. Clint, the 10 largest number two childhood group for 1907. I mean, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? This is the same time as Picasso painting Le Damiselle. Has anyone seen any Hilma L. Clint paintings? Did you see this show at the Tate with Mondrian? Yeah. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, did. Yeah, did. Yeah, did. Yeah, did. Yeah, I saw it. It's very good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was last year, isn't it? And yeah. um, that that was my first time I know her her work. I never heard her, her, I never heard about her before. But it was a good connection with the Mondrian in that show because they both living in the same time and they have this kind of weird connection on how looking at the painting, how looking at the um, yeah abstraction elements. 
So it follows the Rudolf Steiner in particular. And the idea of the different planes of reality, the etheric realm, the subtle realm, spiritual plane, cosmic realm. And she was told by Steiner that she wouldn't be able to show her work until 30 years after her death. But they were preserved, so they were kept in Sweden. And slowly the, there was a rumor about them. And they were not really shown until the 70s when there was a kind of uptake of the idea of the spiritual in art in a new way. But she was the first, I mean, make her into the first abstract artist. The urinal is not plumbed in, therefore it cannot function. Thus the urinal is castrated or stands for castration, the relationship of the phallus and logos striated. It casts everything into a state of loss, therefore adrift, dislocated, and so in a state of passage that points towards the aesthetics of movement as opposed to that of the static. The male no longer fits in, therefore cannot piss. If the male cannot piss, can he instead sublimate? What becomes of the subject position yeah, in the process of this passage? And does it imply another passage which traces knowing one's place to losing such a place? Is sublimation a throwing to the wind and hence is the fountain a kind of sublimation of pissing? Whatever, Duchamp disconnects the plumbing that leads to a sensuous shining or the, or the beautiful to a plumbing designed for the operation of the schema that mediates the passage from the image to the concept, thus allowing different registers and mediums to, recon to reconfigure in the process. Uh, maybe it's just a concern to me. It's just a, maybe a concern to me. I don't know if that it's not a, maybe it's not an issue. adds to the reading of Duchamp or not. You can do that in, in New York, but the buildings I've worked on in New York over the time never had to back into a street to, to, do, the, to do the loading on it. But what does R. Mutt stand for? Isn't that something slightly... He signed it. He signed it. I've seen out on the streets. So it was false signature. No doubt it's a pun at the, the root of it. Yeah. With rating, right? At least get the turning radiuses and stuff. I mean, it'll have a original piece of this. I think once there's a plan or an I mean, it wasn't, uh, it disappeared the original. Fold that in with team one. And that ended it was reconstituted. Really looking at all those okay. traffic patterns, et cetera, right? What was the yeah, reaction of the public? This week, we'll have at least a, a version mm -hmm. of a sketch version that they can just comment on and say, well, yeah, the art critical okay world. It didn't I mean, get, it didn't get shown. Right? Yeah. It, it was kicked out of the exhibition. Just, and so Duchamp didn't make sure someone took a uh, Steiner or whatever else took a photograph of it. It yeah, didn't yeah, really yeah. hit the so, public. Uh, he didn't really yeah, resurrect it until he started making his boxes. And then he made a little miniature of it. It was only that time that it really came to light that it actually, in the public domain, that it actually, it was his work. He did. I mean, his friends knew. But he, he, that there was a gallery. There was an exhibition in which they said anybody could, anything was acceptable, and he was one of the judges. And so he put this in there without telling him it was his, and they rejected it, and so he resigned from the. Uh, being a judge, um, and never told them that it was his. And then adds those photos taken of it. And then I guess it got lost. Um, and then when he was making these um, boxes. Green boxes. Yeah, whatever you call You know, the briefcase, whatever is it called, that? the green box and things like that, the earlier ones. He made replicas of that. Um, and then it came to light that it was his. I'm just conscious of everybody's time. And there was a there was a photograph by Deedlick. Yeah, he made sure he got a good photograph. Uh, it. But he, it wasn't public. It wasn't in the public domain. That he, it was his work. He kept it kind of secret for right, well, some thank years. Thank you guys for uh, being here. Okay. Interesting. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. See ya. Einstein's Battleship Potemkin 1925 was a radical experiment in the art of montage, utilising dramatic shifts in imagery in order to capture the conflict of forces at play. 
Free from the boundaries of time and space, I coordinate any and all points of the universe, whatever I want them to be. My way leads towards the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus, I explain in a new way the world unknown to you. Ziga Vertov, man with a movie camera. A very different concept of montage to Eisenstein. Eisenstein was much more almost party orientated than Bertov. Bertov had the eye of the, of the street much more. Early Soviet cinema inaugurated experiments in montage. Montage was based upon a disavowal of narrative continuity. It was in turn an alignment with the changing perceptions of the machine age. Vertov evoked a new way to explain the world that was still unknown, creating in turn fresh perceptions of reality. Alexander Rodchenko worked across several different mediums in order to develop his aesthetic based on the new visual dynamics of the emerging machine age. His photography was based upon radical points of view and framing, which stressed new ways of encountering reality. The graphic art cut the image into figurations of typography, colour and geometry. A Chien Andalou, an Andalusian dog by Louis Brunuel and Salvador Dali was a film that was like the bite of a dog. It was said that Andalusian dogs howl when someone dies, so the question of the film resolves revolves around the question of who or what dies. The structure of the film creates a disjunctive logic in which the relationship between the sexes is played out within a heightened series of vignettes or dreamlike passages. The howl itself signifies the convulsive force of passion that erupts with a striated narrative which itself is untamed by the rationalising logic dictated by the structure of speech. Behind all acts of speech, there is the basic and wild sound of the howl, which is the vehicle of primal becoming. The howl is the cut within narrative flow, just as the cut of the eye is a rupture of optical continuity. You could say that the howl um, is almost functions like the pure word in romantic poetry. Max Ernst drew upon 19th century material in order to create a disjunctive logic of the present. What finds its force trying to escape the totality of form, seeking instead the passage that leads to beyond form. This idea of the beyond manifests as disjunction and fragmentation. Man Ray, Marquise Cassati, 1922. How to think the syncope, a word designating an eclipse, interval, absence, followed by a new departure. Verena Conley. This is from the, um, the preface to the um, book by Catherine Clement, which is one of the main books on syncope. That's a cover. Last one. <laughs> Throughout the 20th century, the inheritance of the romantic text was pronounced within the margins of critical theory, and in particular amongst the constellation of German theorists known as the Frankfurt School. Writers such as Adorno, Benjamin, Krakauer and Bloch saw the minor genre of the Denkbild or thought image because it offered a way outside of more pragmatic philosophical treaties in a recent book on this tradition, Gerhard Richter writes that the Denkbild encodes a poetic form of condensed epigrammatic writing in textual snapshots, popping up as poignant mediations that typically fasten upon a seemingly peripheral detail or marginal topic, usually without a developed plot or a prescribed narrative agenda, yet charged with theoretical insight. Has anyone come at, what's Denken? Denken. To think. To think, that's right. And build his image. So thought images. 
And what's there's a pun Denken and Danker. Oh uh, yeah. No Danker is to, to, to thank. Denken is to think. So there's a relationship. Heidegger makes his pun or relationship between Denken and Danker. Who would like to read? I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer because I'm keen on the dialectical image. Mm -hmm. The dialectical image. It is not the case that things past shed their light on present things, not that present things shed their light on things past, but the image is that moment where the past enters like a lightning bolt into the constellation with the now. In other words, image is dialectics in a standstill. Walter Benjamin. So we've got the uh, Sansa is a Caesarea, the interruption. Who imagines that this is the center of a couple of books, particularly the um, Arcade Project? Um, but it's uncertain to whether or not he saw it as a, a method which one could employ, or whether it was almost an aesthetic figure running through the text. But I think what wasn't his view of the dialectical image, you couldn't really pin it down between his various writings. It shifted about a bit. It shifted. So he, he kept it as an aesthetic form. It wasn't, wasn't subject to reduction into a philosophical so, so it's not something you can control, it's something that's just going to occur. I mean, he was influenced by surrealism. He was influenced by Marxism on one side, so kind of something which would have a, a methodological root. Mm -hmm. his, in, his influence of surrealism took him away from that. So it's a, it was both, both factors sort of fighting one another. Could you then say there's some sense of an aporia um, in this description of... Um... He, he goes from Hodelin and the idea of Caesarea and what can't be said as well and what's pure, the pure word. So the interruption is a pure word. So you've got a relationship which goes right back to the Romantics. You've got the relationship of Marx in the 19th century. You've got the relationship to the Australians in the 20th century. All, all three contest. So he's a post, he's a post romantic. He's a Marxist and he's a surrealist and he's also uh, Jewish. So there's a little bit of Kabbalah in it as well. And he managed to keep, I mean, he had a friendship with Bertolt Brecht. Um, and he had a friendship with Adorno. And Adorno hated Brecht or disliked Brecht. I don't know if he hated him. Um, and he also had, I forgot the name of the Jewish mystic. But he, he kind of went from world to world. And he collected children's stories. And famously had Paul Clay's Angel Navala's painting, owned it. And he wrote a famous aphorism after that, one of the most famous aphorisms of the 20th century. In his book on his final writing was the um, his study of history and temporality, um, written in 1930, 1939, just before a year before he committed suicide. Brecht's art, Brecht's art was focused on drama 
defined as epic theater that drew upon Eisenstein's theory of montage, a cubist construction of multiple spatial encounter, Slavosky's idea of making strange ideas of interruption or caesura drawn from romanticism and the experimental staging influenced by Piscador. So Benjamin wrote a book, called, well, it's a series, there's a, a publication called Under Sun in Brecht. Um, by Lothar, Punish, Punition, 1929. Greece's universe was a world that was turned inside out. The realms of night and day, the rules of ordinary physics, are all turned over with endless puns and realignments, thus suspending the relationship to a fixed model of reality. René Magritte, The Red Model, 1937. It's like waiting for Godot. Waiting for Godot, 1952, caused a sensation when it was staged because it appeared to have neither direction nor conclusion. This feeling of a drifting temporality gave rise to a sense of futility, which was in turn amplified by the stark stage, stark stage setting. One of the early um, productions was Giacometti did the, the staging. Fragments are written as unfinished separations, Maurice Blanchot, The Writing of Disaster. The old meditation on the idea of the fragment, which is rooted in Romanticism. Fragments. Maurice Blanchot, in writing about written fragments, said that for fragments destined partly to the blank that separates them, finds this gap not with, not what ends them, but what prolongs them, or what makes them await their prolongation, what has already prolonged them, causing them to persist on account of their incompletion. For Blanchot, fragmentary writing is not just a risk, but risk itself, for even in interruption it continues, suspended, for fragmentation is the spacing that indicates the absence of time. Simply put, Fragmentary writing for Blanchot does not belong either to the one or to, or to identity. Rather, it presents a separation from the manifest as a language of awaiting. I think there's a lot to learn from this. Uh, the idea of not just a risk, but risk itself. And fragmentation is spacing. And it's this idea of prolongation. This matter of the, vis of the visible everything is a trap, Jacques Lacan. That's a rather enigmatic statement. What, what do you think he, he might mean by this? Uh, that there might be things that um, are not necessarily visible that matter. So it's not just what you can see that makes a difference. I mean, the world comes back to you as uh, objects look at you, undo you. They're constituted out of the gaze. What's this famous... Account of the gaze, the difference between the, have you anyone read the four fundamentals of psychoanalysis? Uh, no, but I, I, I think it's, it's something along the lines of um, that what you look at also looks back at you and that there's an interaction. Um, so it's not a, it's not a passive thing on, on your part. There's a famous story of him going out with Breton fishermen and um, 
there's some something as strange has happened. Some, some death has occurred, but he's on the boat, and the sun's shining, and something glistening in the water, and it's a sardine can, um, can. and um, there's a conversation about this sardine can, where one of the fishermen said, "Look, it's looking at you." And it's, it's, it kind of undoes him. It's, it's kind of a story which doesn't quite completely add up. It's, so there's a sense in which you, you're captured by, un, uninvited, it's like t taken by surprise. Mm. It's an essay on think... light. It's a beautiful piece of writing. That he wrote. Yeah. And the, the gaze is a, it's a different ocular. So it's a kind of the, the, the eye becomes the, is arrested from perspectival seeing. It becomes an orbit, a kind of bowl. When he talks about the the real, the imaginary, the symbolic, um, in the in the four fundamentals, doesn't he? And then the mirror yeah. fade. I mean, he, he revised Kant, and the real isn't reality. It's beyond representation. It's, it's what gets in the way. It's like an aporia. The symbolic is language, the imaginary is the image. I mean, to simplify it, I, an image is ambivalence. So reality is structured according to language in the can. And desire is negative. Desire is always a desire for more desire. It never completes itself. That's Hegel, isn't it? It kind of, it's from his reading of Hegel. This is where Deleuze and Guattari refute Lacan. The idea of desire is always affirmative. For Lacan, the founding truth of the unconscious is that the moment it finds or is disclosed to itself, it must also founder in the forgetting of itself. In effect, there is no direct access of truth for the divided subject constituted within the order of language because this is marked by negativity. Jonathan, could, could you unpack that a little bit, particularly the second sentence? I find that very difficult to comprehend. No direct access of truth for the divided subject. Um, it's taken from, if you go to Hegel's preface in the Phenomenology of the Mind, number 32, he says that the subject only finds itself when it confronts death or dissolution. So it's radically divided by its coming to be only when it, it discovers its relationship to un, undoing or dissolution. So the subject is divided in in Hegel. And Lacan took this idea to divide a subject that the subject isn't transparent to itself, doesn't see itself. That's why analysis is needed. Um, you get in Schelling a similar perception as well. The, su the subject isn't transparent, isn't self-transparent, is marked by a difficulty. It undoes itself. Does that explain? Yeah, no, thank you. Another reader. I'll, I'll read. Morning Sun, 1952. In this Edward Hopper painting, there is a single woman on bed looking out, at, looking off the window at the empty sky, 
but the thought occurs that perhaps she is like a light bulb, centered, alone, but without a shade. Thus, the imaginary light bulb figure is provisional, unattended, resting on the edge of being, there and not there. It is a painting about silence, emptiness and light, within a search for intervals that will probably never appear. Joseph Cornell, Untitled, The Hotel Eden, 1945. Robert Rauschensberg's relationship with the idea of the fragment begins with his idea of the gifts of the street. If the street had a chaotic feel to it, then he wanted his work to be closer to what happens outside of the window than to the studio domain. This was a way of letting the world into his art, and it is this raw quality that is evident in the early phase of his work. The critic Leo Steinberg said that Rauschenberg's picture plane is for the consciousness immersed in the brain of the city. The use of fragments was both connected to the sensation of movement, but like television as a form, also a sense of the unbounded. Perhaps the secret of fragmentation in this regard is not only does it break up the formal coherence of entities, but it also suggests new ways in which things might be read from the standpoint of the loss of narrative modes of communication. Sai to Mombli. Symposis of a Battle, primary title, 1968. What Tumombly missed about New York was the quality of rubbish he would find on the street. Sorry, Jonathan, did I pronounce his name wrongly? Sai Tombly. Sai Tombly. Apologies. All right. We do it all the time. Jean-Francois Lyotard claimed that the truth is out of tune and as such does not pass through the discourses of significance, signification. The artwork is invariably out of tune, untimely or against the grain. Orson Welles, The Lady from Shanghai, 1947. The Lady from Shanghai, 1948, was directed by Orson Welles, and it draws upon multiple narrative genres, including film noir, surrealism, fairy tales, and myth. The final scene is a shootout within a hall of mirrors, in which the images no longer have fixed location, so both characters die as an image within the mirrored glass, and it is, as it is progressively shattered. This passage has a dreamlike quality that suspends the violence into the pleasurable suspension of cinematic montage. Each frame appears as an event, as well as being the culmination of the narrative. There is within this difference the feeling of each of the various frames being carefully composed and through the editing process being joined into a compelling eruption of visual sense. It is a scene that could not be adequately scripted, but instead emerges from the possibilities that the camera and lighting effects make possible as a li limit experience. The fragmentation of the image is then followed by its shattering. So the dissolution of these two registers of defamation is captured by the death of both characters as the third character looks on and then walks away. I mean, it's still a really stunning. I mean, especially in conjunction with the time they were composed. This is Alfred Hitchcock, The Wrong Man, from 1956. Montage means the assembly of pieces of film, which, when moved in a rapid succession, a su suggestion before the eye creates an idea. Alfred Hitchcock. 
That's called 45 seconds, which changed cinema. Yeah. A story should have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. Jean-Luc Godard. In the film, Two or th Three Things I Know About Her, 1967, the main character plays the roles of a wife, a prostitute and a consumer, whilst drawing attention to the fact that she is an actress playing these roles. Dead objects are still alive. Living persons are often already dead. Numero Deux was released in 1975, and this was one of the first films to be released within the art cinema mainstream, to be shot in video and then reshot on 35 millimeter. Instead of a single continuous image, there are different monitors showing to aspects of an unfolding reality within a black surround of space. This, the, the film itself starts by Goddard at work in his studio, interrogating the nature of the production process in a manner that is in accord with the Brochian alienation effect. The, the film itself focuses on forms of sexual difference with within the family, playing off between ideas of the political and the pornographic. The act of factoring cinematic space appears to be in accord with notions related to decentered physical space through the mechanics. Sorry, psych, psychic. Psychical. Psychical space through the me mechanisms of subjectivity might resolve, which the mechanisms of subjectivity might resolve. Art is like fire born from what it burns. Jean-Luc Godard, Histoire du Cinéma. This is a still from the Jeté, which is all made up of stills except for a few seconds where the an eye moves. Le Jeté, 1962, by Chris Marker, presents two forms of an annihilation. First, the destruction of nuclear war, but within this, there is an annihilation of the subject itself. The film conveys a menace related to the presentation of what is unpresentable or impossible. Rather than a representation of time, it is a film in search of time. The film essay by Mark Sunless, 1983, is the exploration of, of a fracturing of time, and with this, the birth of another logic of temporality. The handwriting each, of us, each one of us will use to compose his own list of things that quicken the heart. Anyway, that was one of the first films which presented the idea of post-modernity. Really interesting film essay. Leotard said that modernity relates to the fragment, but post-modernity to the essay form. Hang on, which, um, when you say, was the essay by Marco, or was it by Leotard? No, the, um, the, 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 the film itself was uh, oh, okay. made up of a series of letters, which were probably composed by Mark himself. It starts off, it, it, a letter is written, or in this letter. Um, so it's a series of about 10 letters. So they very much function as like a film essay with letter, letter form. And what did Leotard say again? Can you Charles please? said that modernity is of the fragment, whereas post-modernity is the essay form. So in it being an essay form, is it sort of like a reconstruction of the fragments coming back together? Um, or an, a further understanding of the fragments? I mean, it's a, it's a further understanding of development from the fragment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still got a fragmentary... Uh, um, 
form to it, the essay. It doesn't totalize. It's not a thesis. No. But it draws upon memory more, in a way. So it's a recollection. The fragment is a disruption, a disavowal, a dissolution. And not looking back too much. This is Guy Debord, who was making, writing his Society of Spectacle in around 1966-67. He introduced the idea of the, the spectacle, a world in which images dissolve into images. Behind the mask of total choice, different forms of the same alienation confront each other. So the total reality of alienation and the spectacle. In Andre Travelski's film, Stalker, 1979, there is a scene in the zone where Stalker is resting alone. It as though he enters a dreamscape in which all the fragments of civilization are embedded within shallow water. There is no distinct narrative without the sequence, just the sense of a warp in time that allows relations between the objects to occur outside of their worldly context, a montage without cuts that occasions or echoes with the notion of a field of non-arrival what Tarkovsky preserved within these echoes folded in a field of attention is a distinction of rhythm governed by the search for time that was articulated as sculpting in time. The, the zone disarticulates the relationship of mind and nature, thereby opening perception to a loss of common sense. Nothing is as it quite appears and it is as though the psyche of the characters start to morph into new configurations of being other. They walk adrift within the strange and they present in turn the exposure of feelings that arise within this strangeness. The zone is like the outside of modernity, not as corrective nor as active negation or even conceptual beyond but rather as its ungraspable and immobile otherness. Words can't express everything. You dream of one thing, but you get quite another. So someone else would like to read. Thank you. I can read, but I just a little bit worried about my pr pronunciation. You read. Yeah, I can. So is Joseph Boyd between double objects. What do we say about the uncanny? One of the main things about one of the main features of the uncanny. What's what's one of its realities? The double. So in a way, it's a kind of construction around something uncanny. But I can just say, yes, I can see that, but actually I don't think it works as the uncanny. Uh, or for me, just looking at this picture, it doesn't work as the uncanny. And I think maybe it's because there are lots of different objects. I don't yeah, know what yeah, the, the, Sometimes an idea is too strong and the execution of the idea isn't good enough. Right. It needs to be maybe sparser. Yeah. It's too clunky, too obvious. Yeah, I agree with that. It's a work called Plight, which he covered the walls with industrial felt, 
just put his grand piano in the room. The artist might wish to say or to show, but this is invariably posited as a meeting point between desire and nothingness within what is inaccessible. The inaccessible is imaginary place of purity, and with this abstraction, Joel Peter Wick in the kiss. So he got the head from, he took this photograph in Mexico, where he was able to kind of source a decapitated head. Art is restoration. The idea is to repair the damage that are inflicted upon life, to make something that is fragmented, which is what fear and anxiety do to a person, into something whole. Louis Bourgeois. Bourgeois, that's good. In George D. D. Huberman's book, Confronting Images, the image itself is rent or subject to incise incision, break, or interruption because it contains within its boundary that which cannot be seen or known in its entirety. For D.D. Huberman, the word of images does not reject the word of logic, but plays with it, offers itself there as a power of the negative. We invariably refer to the emptiness of the image. Something is there, but also missing elsewhere. But what is the image? When there is nothing that is where the image finds its condition, but disappears into it. This is from two versions of the imaginary. In the space of literature. This is a Mimo Rotella, which is decolors. They took street posters and made tears into them, finding a new reality beneath the surface. His work is based on the principle of decollage, which impl employed the method of tearing away at existing street posters. The test series by Warhol are cons consisted of a standard hundred feet of film, which lasted for just over three minutes. Aesthetic indifference was a main feature of this under undertaking. He didn't develop a lot of the film until after he died. It, it was made into a work. But he used to film visitors, famous, particularly famous visitors to the studio for three minutes, 15 seconds, in which they couldn't talk. They just had to sit and be filmed. You can get a lot of them online as Susan Sontag as um but um Bob Dylan is one. One of the aspects of form that I have been very interested in is stasis, the concept of form which is not so directional in time, not so much pli climactic form, but rather form which allows time to stand still. Dream House, Lamonti Young. This is from about 1960, Leisure Clark Maxwell Structures. Robert 
Master of its Cadillac Chopsticks, 1985. The painting by Mark Tens Tens Tensy depicts the writer Rob Gre Grillet's cleansing. Sorry? You don't pronounce the T, Grillet. Oh, Grillet. Grillet cleansing every object inside. 1981. It is an allegorical depiction of history as ruination being, staged in turn as a site of impossible gestures. The task at hand is infinite or endless, cleansing objects before they sink back into a state of becoming dust. Zara Harris Happy Monday, untitled to 2006. Rather than a vision of a culture that would dream its own coherence, we are presented with a shadow realm consisting of vestiges and shards in which images fuse into other images. Creating swarms, swarms in turn give rise to the idea of in intensi intensification around a point closer to an eruption as, as opposed to a stable location or fixed identity. So this is the famous Hegel quote from the preface, the phenology of the mind or spirit. But the life, you, you read it. Okay, but the life of spirit is not a life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation. But but rather the life that endures, endures it and maintains itself in it. It wins its truth only when, in utter dismemberment, dismem mem it finds itself. Here you go. Can I just um, speak about that, that last, yeah. this idea that, truth that the subject finds its truth at its dismemberment and moment of death meaning that you own what that you only know about your life because you're about to lose it i mean it could be that you live you, you, the intensification of life is lived in the, through knowing you're going to die and living that life with that knowledge Yes, but at the moment of death, uh, the subject knows its truth. Or, I mean, but what truth? I guess my question is, what truth does he mean? Uh, what are you talking about? Like the whole truth? Uh, it's kind of a. I don't know. I I find it a bit problematic. I suppose. I mean, it's nineteenth century, early nineteenth century. Yeah. Rather than light that endures it and maintains itself in it, I and mean, it's less. It's not so dark when you think about it. No. But the fact that it win the th this thing about it's, it wins its truth only when in utter disamemberment it finds itself. That's the bit that I kind of... Aren't there many, many moments in, in, in life when some truths are apparent? But that's the fundamental one. The fundamental one is that in, in relationship to the... I mean, in Romanticism, there's the preoccupation with the finite and the infinite. Right. Um, and in a sense, one of the ways of looking at that is the relationship between life and death. And between, in Hegel, light, light and night. So we've got these dialectics. Yep. And... But life that endures it and maintains itself in it. I mean, I think that's. I mean, I don't think it's too extreme. No. Okay.
I mean, we don't necessarily go around articulating ourselves in those terms, but a lot of artists concerned with that relationship. You're dealing all the time with temporality and the idea that perhaps art comes to an end, dies. Um, there is some basic existential resonance within the work of art. So it's, it's portrait, tell portrait, is a sort of point of dissolution. I'm not saying he's illustrating Hegel. No. But it's a way of seeing fragmentation. Sarah Lucas Nudd's series. One more. New new right uh, reader who's willing to read. It's almost near the end. I I would like to read about the my my background. Probably is too noisy. Okay, um, someone else then. Lots of people here. Sarah Lucas produced a series. Of, go on. Me? Yeah. Um, Sarah Lucas produced a series of works called Nuds, 2010, which both evoke the modernist fragmentation of form, but also the memory of archaic forms. In this way, there is both a folding of forms, form forming form, and within this, the fold of temporal registers. This in turn evokes Deleuze's notion that subjectification is created by folding. So if you want to read about subjectification for created by folding, it's in his book on um, Foucault. You go to, I think it's page 77. It talks about the four folds of subject, subjectification, the fold of the outside, the fold of the body, the fold of forces. 8-6, page 8-6. What's that? 8-6, page 8-6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Of a subject case, and I'm just reading it. In the serial work by Ronnie Horn, Stillwater, the River Thames, for example, 1999, there is a depiction of the river with an aphoristic text below that functions as a form of textual unconscious. It was one of the really interesting works of the period. In John Acomfra's work, Vertigo Sea, 2015, the depiction of the Atlantic Sea occupies the multiple screens of the film installation. Images are appropriated from archives of television films of the sea, historical restaging pertaining to the slave trade and colonialism are constructed Memories of whaling are evoked, switching and slicing of temporal level are inscribed into a mobile depiction of the relationship of time, image, which evoke Walter Benjamin's notion of the dialectical image. Sarah, I don't know how you pronounce that. C. Huh? C. C, Sarah C. Fixed points, finding a home, 2012. Garbage. Civilization did not rise and flourish as men hammered out hunting scenes on bronze gates and whispered philosophy under the stars, with garbage as a noisome offshoot swept away and forgotten. No, garbage arose first, inciting people to build, build civilization in response, in self defense. We had to find ways to discard our waste, to use what we couldn't discard, to reprocess what we couldn't use. Garbage pushed back. It mounted and spread, and it forced us to develop the logic and rigour that would lead to systematic investigations of reality, to science, art, music, mathematics. 
John DeLillo, Underworld, page 287. In this installation, Cuba, Kutlag, Ataman, Kutlag, Ataman recorded interviews in which the citizens of a district in Istanbul live. Many are Kurdish living, many are Kurdish living in the margins of mainstream life, so it becomes a collective portrait of the dispossessed. Each voice is equal to the next, and the way they might link into a greater narrative is subject to the reality of discontinuity, which is inbuilt, inbuilt into its staging. Collage or montage are assemblies of found material cut or edited into an assembly of parts in a process of becoming a new co-belonging. Rather than being a production, it is closer to being an eruption of becoming, offering an oscillating tension of parts on the edge of chaos. Put in another way, it's a re it is a representation passing into the presentation of an unworking of the image, which opens the passage of imagination towards the to come. The image is the mental event imminent within the working of the material artifact, like a flash of indeterminacy. Christian Marclay, The Clock, 2010. Paris Lyspector, Agua Viva. Is my theme the instant, the theme of my life? I try to keep up with it. I divide thousands of times into as many times as the number of instants running by, fragmented as I am, and the moment so fragile, my only vow is to life born, with time and growing along with it. Only in time itself is there room enough for me. That might be a counterpoint to the Hegel um, statement. If not winter, fragments of Sappho, Anne Carson. From poet and classicist Anne Carson comes this translation of the work of Sappho, together with the original Greek. During her life on the island of Lesbos, Sappho is said to have composed nine books of lyrics. Only one poem has survived complete. In If Not, Winter, Carson presents all the extant fragments of Sappho's verse, employing brackets and white space to denote missing text allowing the reader to imagine the poems as they were written. Carson says of her method of, I, I like to think that the more I stand out of the way, the more Sappho shows through. Anne Carson's book of poems, Knox, Latin for night, is an elegy for her brother, which is organized around a mass of fragments out of which poetry itself emerges prowling the meanings of a word, prowling the history of a person, no use expecting a flood of light. Human words have no main switch, but all those little kidnaps in the dark. And then the luminous, big, shivering, discandied, unrepentant, barking web of them that hangs in your mind when you turn back to the page you were trying to translate. It's a magnificent book. Really great work. Enrico David, Untitled 2023. The space of the work is imbued with silence, stillness, and solitude. It is as if approaching midnight, the point where time when time neither moves forwards or backwards. Perhaps it is a waiting room which is being figured, but one without entry or exit points. Does something linger there? Maybe a spectre or trapped, partially erased memory. Suspended, lingering, waiting, pressed under refrains within space and interruption in time are being presented within these registers. The nun looks on, but her lips are sealed, indicating subtraction or withdrawal of the subject's power of authorship. What appears to be offered is the experience of being with the assemblage and the isolated intensity which comes with this. Not absorption, but closer to fascination, and with this time's absence. What then are the constituent features of this work? A painterly transcription of a photographic image, a 19th century Chinese lock, and a sculptural fragment. There is no obvious connection between these elements. 
which instead the occasioning of a relationship, discontinuity, rupture and heterogene heterogeneous discharge. In effect, they are marked by a patina of difference. There is within this disorder a relationship to the aphorism or the textual voyages of the Gina romantics that comes to mind and circulates within an unfolding intensity. Abigail Norris, Cal, 2022. It's the last image. Would you like, Abigail, would you like to say something? But, um, in relation to the fragment? Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, what do I say? Um, it's looking back at you. Yeah, I mean, this strange for me, um, this is meant to kind of push at you, really, because you know it's not real. Um, and yet you can't help but feel and sense that it's real. Um, so there's a kind of fragmentary experience um, of knowing something, but not knowing, not understanding. Um, yeah. What and this your, sort of make it two thirds bigger than life size. It's that, um, I mean, I yeah, I'd like to have made it a bit bigger, actually, just because um, I think the impact would have been more obvious. But it, it's too, um, well, to shrink the viewer in a way, to make you um, form a different relationship with it. Um, and it's also this, you know, the thing of 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 death, to bring in this kind of, um you know this the weight the heaviness of death um and um kind of push at your your sense your 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 feelings of aliveness um and that though the material i mean i'm i didn't there were aspects of this that i sort of felt like i hadn't quite really understood before I started making it, but there are sort of elements of the material itself that I feel I haven't quite resolved um, in the sense that, you know, I quite like to have had um, some of the carpet used in another way, and I, I'm still, you know, it still goes round and round in my head, this piece. Thank you. The fragment discontinuous, it interrupts, seeking a condition of its own making. So many voices, so many images. It does and does the success with the disruption of references by virtue of slippage into the realm of the autotelic. These are some of the references. And then the PowerPoints could be downloaded from the chat. And I will get the PowerPoint up on the website in the next day or so. Um, I know we haven't got much time. Can I just flag something up that I thought was really interesting um, in that talk for me. I'm reading Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf at the moment. Um, and um, it, it seems so relevant to what we've just been um, talking through in this sense that um, he is this character who is sort of fragmented from society. He's, he is in a process of dissolution in a way. Um, and he's permanently thinking towards his death. Um, just thought it was really fascinating this sort of, um, how it, it, the story itself just relates so beautifully to this feeling of his space and the gap that you were talking about with Marie, Maurice Blanchet. Blanchet. Um, Blanchet that um, he, 
it, he's creating this, this space between him and society and um, every everything, everyone around him. And he basically just starts to dissolve and he's sort of fragmented between being human and animal. Um, it's just, yeah, just sort of flag it up. Were you shocked by the cow at the end? I was actually. <laughs> You're not expecting it. It's like, oh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I thought it might be present for you through the, the text. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are there any ideas or thoughts? Well, I, I'm intrigued, as you know, by Walter Benjamin's dialectical image and, uh, you know, how the fragments and how things can combine to create something that's different from the, uh, the individual fragments themselves. I mean, it's got a kind of strange quality, hasn't it? It's there and it's not there. It's um, thought and it's unthought. I mean, it touches on everything, and it, and yet it, it's, it's hardly there. It's like a vapor, rather than an object. <coughs> it's formless. Yeah. It sort of feels like it. It's like the juxtaposition <coughs> of fragments. It's sort of, it's like it, putting them together. It's sort of. They're, they're fragmentary in the, in a sense, they're form, without form in a sense, but then it's sort of, by putting them together, it sort of pertains to another form that you can't, that's sort of not actually graspable, but it's still, it's sort of like hints at, hints towards a form behind this loss of form. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, we, we've been living through a culture that doesn't lend itself to be grasped very easily in its aesthetic manifestation. Does uh, fragmentation also means like um, take, taking the truth to be more possibility, it's like to completely open up the world so in another sense, could be become everything. For example, if we're talking about montage, and the, the result of a montage can be something completely different than what it was. So this is also the sense of a fragmentary, right? I mean, it's also that which doesn't complete itself, so it's still resonating. Yeah. Then the complete and then never, mm, never come out to the closure. Yeah. So it's that which makes becoming possible as an aesthetic medium. Yeah. Um, does it also mean the, 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 the kind of the sense of the process or it's just like a component in in the sense of a becoming. I mean, it's just, I mean, this idea is the, the work of art is a double object. It's both a thing and it's a speculation on what a thing could become. So it's always be, there's always an aspect to the work of art if it's a work of art. It's always got a speculative content which never arrives at the scene, never completes. It's always lies there as potentiality of being arrested yet again and coming to the fore. I mean, in another sense, right, if you think of the collage or the montage, they tend to work um, with this limit and the relationship between different limits um, and the counter 
you know, the, the different worlds that come together and create new worlds. But it's all, they tend to work, they tend to focus on the on the limit, on the edge, on the yeah. boundary. It's that that's, and the, the rupture of two different, of multiple spaces and the way that creates a new, uh, a new becoming, a new, new, a new world, effectively, as a, um, the, the multiple, multiplicity becomes something other than itself. Um, um, which I don't necessarily see, um, which can be a very productive thing. I, I, I don't necessarily see it um, in this uh, guise of, um, I don't know, um, what to an essay. I, I guess I would, I'm taking a more delusion as, uh, aspect to it. Right? It's, no, more, it's more affirmative, yes. Um, I would be anti Lacan's approach to it, um, a much more positive um, manifestation of the world. Um, yeah. And to me, that's interesting. I mean, it opens up multiplicities, doesn't it, in, in uh, Deleuze? It emphasizes the idea of reality as a, a creative flux. Yeah. Which multiplicities are issued. I mean, you can see it as uh, emergence from the milieu, milieu of the world, right? Uh, coming together of different limits, different edges, and creating a new worlds. Um, we don't have to see it as... Um, kind of end of us or something more remoteness. I don't necessarily view it I mean, that he way. simply says, bring something new into the world. Yeah. I mean, I think he would be against, the you know, it doesn't have to be, um, have a mel melancholic to it that were, Benjamin would, on Benjamin would, uh, view, Benjamin's view of the world would, would, would say. It's much more positive, mm. and I think that's against Foucault, right? Because Foucault would would be much would be against Deleuze's idea of what's the word? Um, uh, ah, my mind's a blank. Um, uh, Dramatization. I think that's much more delusing than. Foucault, um, yeah. Anyway, I see it as a more positive, in a full positive way. That's the only choice left. We're going to, we've not got the time for the presentation today, so that's going to be put on until next week. And okay.